So uh, we've got another thing's hidden this time for the Western church. This is the time of uh, the Holy Weekend, right? We've got Good Friday that we're doing this on, and then um, we're going to publish this on Sunday is the plan. And um, that is Easter for a lot of people in the Christian tradition. And Shannon Braswell, who's with me, he said he wanted to do some conversation about resurrection and ask me some questions, and I'll ask him questions or whatever. So how you doing, Shannon? I'm good, bro. How are you? I'm doing great. What's new with you? Nothing much, man. Just uh, trying to, uh, you know, carry out the rest of the Easter season. You know, today's Good Friday, so, you know. Very good. Yeah. And what was the thing that Jesus said at the end on the cross on Good Friday? What did he say? For, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. No, his final said, words. Finished. Mm-hmm. It is, it's been completed. For you, what was finished on the cross when he said that? You know, I, I, that is, that's sort of a, that's an interesting question because I've, I've always thought of it in terms of, well, if, if Jesus is the one that, you know, destroys sin and death, then you know, is that, is that like for all time did that start at the beginning, you know, once he, once he died and went into, you know, whatever Sheol or whatnot. Um, so that's, that's, that's sort of an a interesting question for me because mm-hmm. I, I've never really, the resurrection is something I've never really delved into that much. You know, I've always thought about like the passion, you know, that sort of thing. But, you know, the death and resurrection of Christ is never, it's, it's maybe because I, maybe because I, maybe because I, I never really wanted to um, think about it as much, you know, and just kind of take it as, as, as a given, you know, based upon faith. But I'm, 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 yeah, I, I have to, I think I have to continue to think more about that. What about you? Man? I, you know, that's a that's a difficult one. Yeah, you wanted to ask me something about the resurrection. What did you want to know? Yeah, I, I, so so you yeah, got to watch out because I, I I'll ask too many questions and get in the way of you asking your questions. So. Know, right. So now my 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 question is you you talk about the you know you keep telling me about this thing about the tomb. Yeah, and I'm trying to figure out you know what how how does that um like solidify for you or you know give you I guess a sense of assurance that the resurrection happened. What, you know, what is the relationship between the tomb and the resurrection of Christ? Well, um, yeah, for me, um, when I discovered the real implications of Rene Girard's work, I've started with I see Satan fall like lightning as the first book I read from him. And uh, for me, it was interesting because it was like, I, I took it as a piece of apologetics, you know, which it, it is, but like, we don't think of Rene Girard as contributing that much in the world of apologetics. You traditionally go to like, you know, classical theistic arguments and stuff, William Lane Craig, those kind of folks in the evangelical community and, right. and um, arguments about the historicity of the uh, resurrection and the, the, why would they send women to give the testimony if they were trying to lie, that would not be a good argument for, for believing in their claims as, as audacious as they were. Those are all good arguments, but Rene Girard's argument kind of was like, wow, that really, it felt as if um, uh, just to put an analogy to it, people who believe in the evidence of UFOs or something, when they see a video on the Navy report, uh, you know, the military report about all these UFOs, it's like you're touching, you're starting to see that there's something more magical about the world than you, than you would be led to believe if you just accept the, the standard line of, of, of materialism, right? That we're all just accidents. We're going to die and mean nothing. And it's all just an illusion, right? And when you see UFOs, it kind of if people who get into that thing, it kind of gives them a little, a little clue that there's a magical world out there in the sense of this world is more electric and unknown than we understand, right? And and I, and I know that sounds weird to compare it to the resurrection, but it's a similar thing. When you see evidence 
Hey, let me put it this way. When you see, when the Pentagon saying, I mean, uh, before I just did the discussion with uh, Blake Masters, who's running for U.S. Senate in Arizona, and he talked about the UFO thing, you know, and the fact that we can have a conversation with a U.S. Senate candidate who has a real shot of being a senator about the UFO thing shows how far we've come in terms of a whole new way of talking about topics that were considered to be taboo and bizarre and out there. And that's because there's so much evidence from the government that there's something going on with that, that it now demands to be talked about. And, and the same thing kind of, I felt happened for me when I read it, read Rene Girard's book, I see St. Fall Light Lightning. Cause I said, Whoa, I always thought that uh, resurrection, you know, apologetic arguments for the real reality of resurrection could only get you so far to the circumstantial evidence. And then you always had that, you know, the resurrection was done in secret. I mean, in private, right? Nobody saw the actual resurrection, right? right? It wasn't a public event in front of the town square where everybody was watching as he popped out of the, out of the cave. Right. right? And so it was always kind of like, well, all the evidence that the church presents in their traditional apologetics can only take you so far, but you still have to have this kind of, uh, there's this tape, caution tape, don't go near the resurrection itself in any kind of evidence, because to do so would be to, uh, to diminish the importance of faith in that part of it, right? right. And, and so when I, saw, when I saw what Rene Girard was saying about the historicity of the resurrection, I felt like, wow, I had crossed past, I had crossed over that caution tape, and I was getting closer to an actual historical piece of evidence that a resurrection really occurred. It wasn't just some mystical faith proposition that we just don't want to talk about as a historical fact. It started to feel the same way that people are now starting to feel that, wait a second, I thought UFOs was just science fiction that, and you're telling me that there's this thing flying around and it goes underwater and it goes up. And, and now senators like Marco Rubio are saying we need to really take this seriously. That's how it felt. I know it's a weird analogy, but that's the best way I can explain it. You know, I mean, it, it's it's um, I don't think it's weird. I think it's it, you know, I mean, yeah, it's maybe the, the analogies are kind of uh, not as close. Right. But like, say, for something like, uh, you know, people say, oh, they saw the appearance of, um, you know, Mary or something like that hovering over, you know, a church or something like that. I remember, uh, you know, seeing things like that. They were. Uh, you know, like in Lords or something like that, they say they saw the image of Mary or fat, you know, Fatima, the children saw, you know, the image of Mary. So it's kind of like, yeah, I mean, I guess it's like a ripple effect, right? Like one person saw it and then another person, you know, and then more people are starting to see this, that same event take place, you know, say in, in, in different places, you know, or wherever, wherever they are, right? Like uh, in the gospels, you know, yeah. I mean, I think you're right. It talks about the women see him first because they go to they go to the cave or they go to where he's buried and they're the ones that actually speak to him first right it's the women right and <clears throat> say perhaps maybe in the time of jesus that might not have been so credible right but at the same time it kind of is because it, it it's sort of flipped right like uh well why would you have women see jesus first Right. Or yeah. whatever. If you're trying to make up a fable and you want to sell people on a resurrection right. for a guy who was just discredited, apparently to the public square, why would you put women as your primary witnesses? They do not have a standing in the court of law. I asked that to, um, uh, Oh my goodness. I can blanking on his name. Now the, uh, the, the, the pr president of the skeptic society, Mike, oh, Michael. Oh my goodness. I'll think of it later but he's the atheist guy that doesn't believe in, you know, he, Michael Schumer or Shermer. Is that Shermer? Yeah. Michael Shermer. And I interviewed him one time and I asked him, I said, but why, if you think they're making this up, why would they, why would they lead with a, a eyewitness your honor exhibit a let's hear her testimony. And they said, wait a second, her, we don't allow that in the court of law for a credible testimony for an accusation. A female's testimony was that of a child or, uh, uh, or an animal. Right. And, you know, I guess a child or something, it was not considered to be a relevant, credible source. So if you want to make something, I mean, it's just, it's just dumb propaganda. If this was propaganda, why would you lead with that? Right. You know, yeah. that's like saying exhibit a your honor, 
in today's society, I have a Nazi who's going to tell us what happened. You know, it's like, why would you bring in someone who is something that's not going to be considered credible right. in our in, in that context of the of the story? And people are risking their lives at the time. They're risking their social standing within their community in Israel, in Jerusalem. Yeah. So there's a, you better get that argument right. And there's no reason to be making it up. Now, one could say, well, just because they said it was uh, women doesn't mean that it actually happened. Mm-hmm. You know, it still was a sensational tale uh, that people hallucinated or they felt like Jesus had resurrected, right? drained they had drinks yeah yeah and and or you know he 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 didn't really die he got injured and he was hiding in the cave or something until he got better and he started limping out saying all right i'm here that's kind of a dumb one but some people believe that um uh so the question is of course is like what 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 am i saying about what renee gerard said that made it feel like okay we have evidence that's more direct and it was because what he was saying was, is that if this was a fiction, you know, how could a fiction have revealed something that humans had never been able to say before, which was that this man was falsely accused. Yeah. And, and the fact that all other societies prior to this time had had hidden victims, but they didn't know they had hidden victims. They believed those hidden victims were gods or ancestors telling them to do the same type of sacrifice, right? Right. So they hadn't. So the idea that you would have something, in other words, the fact that the resurrection created division in the community in which it was reported is a piece of historical evidence yeah. that something really real did happen. Because if it was another fabricated dying and rising myth, it wouldn't have created schism. It have created unity, and it would have been reported differently. Right. Does that make sense? That that's a very interesting argument. I know that people who are new to Rene Girard might be like, "What?" But if yeah. you follow his argument, right. it is this dramatic evidence that is almost beyond just the eyewitness reports. Right. It's almost like you're looking scientifically at the pattern of history, and you're saying, "Wait a second! In this historical case, there's a dying and rising savior, and there's no there's no schism over." Right. And this, and over here, Horus. There's no schism over. We don't hear about the Egyptians saying Horus really did resurrect. We saw him in the flesh and it created a counter movement that ripped Egypt apart. That doesn't happen. Right. Right. It's also, unified. It's unified in his in his historic and his murder is not a gritty news report. Right. He was whipped 16 times. He drank a cup of water. He was whipped. You know, it wasn't like that. It's just this disembodied cartoonish uh, mythic story of Horus dying and rising. Right. Right. And I, you know, and also I think with the, with the, you know, you alluded to, I think an interesting point where, you know, you have this idea of the dying and rising God, right? And there's a number of those, I think in the ancient, you know, ancient religions, like you said, like Horus, you know, you've got, uh, uh, who was it, you know, Dionysus or whatever, you know what I mean? So, you know, and you, you hear a lot of people trying to make comparisons to the story of Christ as a, you know, as a dying and rising God, you know, but for me, I think the, the, the end point is that Jesus doesn't, you know, the story of Christ's resurrection doesn't rely on sort of a cyclical story. You know, it's not like you're just, he's continuously dying and rising, you know what I mean? Or some sort of representation of like the spring and, and fall. Right. But he's like, you know, he rises from the dead, you know, is resurrected. And that's the final, you know, the final death and resurrection. It doesn't have this continual, you know, circulation. That's sort of the, you know, I think the break to, for me, like the break with the myth, the, the, the way to explain mythology, you know, or the way it was explained in the past, right. And stories being explained in the past, right. Is, well, this is the reason why we have these seasons. This is the reason why we have, you know, say death and life and whatever, you know, and Jesus, I think break, you know, the story of Christ breaks that mold, right. Where you're not, you're not dealing with, you know, a a cyclical, cyclical event. Right. So, you know, um, yeah, there's no, there's no, um, 
the Christian uh, movement doesn't go out and reenact a animal sacrifice or a human sacrifice to commemorate Jesus's death. Right. Yeah. Whereas all other, all other religions to various degrees were still continuing sacrifice, whether it was human or uh, animal or, uh, or, or other types of sacrificial rituals, like uh, certain types of war rituals, right. which are kind of like a scapegoat mechanism sacrifice, but a little bit different. Yeah. I think that's important because some of the more sophisticated in terms of civilizational uh, awareness had done away with some of the human sacrifices in, in some of the Greek and Roman cultures around yeah. when, in which Jesus comes into history. Right. But they still were engaged in a kind of uh, sacrificial of uh, sacrifice of humans when it came to war and, uh, and, and still in just mob beatings. Right. The idea that a peasant could get away with uh, impugning the honor of someone better than him in the Roman hierarchy, he could get savaged and, and, and lynched in the streets. So it wasn't a formal human sacrificial ritual, but it was still the way in which you dealt with disturbances in the structure of the society, right? And Jesus's message and his events, not, it's not just his message. And I was listening to Rene Girard recently, again, on CBC, and he makes a point. You cannot divorce the teachings of Jesus from his death, burial, and resurrection. His teachings of nonviolence are not some clean little platitude thing that's separate from the death, burial, and resurrection. No, the teachings are a survival guide for how humans are going to have to get along once he destroys the scapegoat mechanism in his death, burial, and resurrection. It's a blueprint. He's saying, he's not just saying, let me be nice. Oh, you killed me. No, he's saying this is how you're going to have to live with one another because I'm going to blow up the old way of doing it and you can't go back. <laughs> right it's very mecha it's very precise <laughs> it's and very that, and that you know i think that's what takes us into this this next part of the conversation which is then what what do we say for you know countries that have a say a strong christian foundation right who continue to maintain some of the older forms of dealing out you know justice or you know, taking vengeance or, you know, revenge or what have you, but they know that, you know, they have the gospels, they know the gospels, they know the teachings, but they don't live by it. Right. So that's the, for me, it's like, well, then, you know, what is the, what is the real effectiveness of Christianity? Is it, is it that Christianity is, you know, Christ is telling you, this is what happens if you continue to live mm -hmm. by the scapegoat mechanism after I've already kind of like, you know, taught you as a master teacher, you know what I mean, as an instructor, right? Or someone to, you know, as as the the prime example to follow. But then you continue to do that, right? How, you know, does that does that just leave us in the kind of this apocalyptic mode where it's like, okay, you know, then you guys are you're choosing to make the decision that's going to basically uh destroy you, right? You're you're choosing to opt for the the apocalyptic version of the message rather than the one that, you know brings in the glory of God on earth or something like that. Well, in my opinion, you know, the stumbling block is what you're talking about. That the, the Bible, the the gospel story is a scandal on it. Makes you stumble. You know, you you walking across a field and you stumble on a rock and you jag the heck out of your foot. That's what it's like. And that's kind of what's happening, right? The West is just walking around on a field and it keeps stumbling. It keeps hitting a rock and jagging itself about the concern for victims. And it can't organize itself anymore. It can't even, it doesn't even want to have policing anymore because it's so haunted by how we deal with victims that it can't even get that right. And people want to defund the police. And that's actually a thing in the West. You don't, is there a defund the police movement in Shanghai right now? I'm sure there's a lot of people in Shanghai who wish they could defund the police, but they do not have the cultural inheritance, unfortunately, as a normative to even proposition such an idea as, hey, we're going to cut your budget if you keep beating us down because we're trying to get food during this lockdown. You see what I mean? And so that's a very important inheritance to understand. And and I would say that, I don't know, it, it's almost as if if you're more Christ haunted, you're more likely to be 
more explosively wealthy as the West has been, but also explosively extinguished as we are now exhibiting because we can't even get along. And we spend so much time, uh, you know, uh, talking about uh, how we're going to change kindergartners to become pangender or pansexual uh, rather than actually teaching them mathematics, how to build a road, how to put pavement down, you know, how to, how to, cl- how to clean the nuclear, uh, uh, you know, laboratories and not blow up the world. All these right. basic things we can't teach in that because we're obsessed with uh, rooting out uh, any kind of differentiation that could lead to oppression. Right. And that's and that's what that's what's going to happen. Here's the thing that's interesting, Shannon, is that we had undifferentiation in other societies before. It's not like we've never had undifferentiation. Right. But the yeah. point was they were they were moments that were stamped out by sacrificial violence. But we can't do that now because every time we press a sacrificial lynching, it does not create the order that it used to. It doesn't create peace. It doesn't create consensus. It creates division and schism. And so we're left with these eternal, like you said, apocalypse unveiling the, uh, the madness of crowds, the madness of human society without God. Right. Right. Yeah. And, 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 uh, you know, for me, it's like uh, also I think of it like this, too, man, the the scientific revolutions, right, that were carried out, say, during the Enlightenment or like, say, during the, the 40s and the 50s, you know, <clears throat> 30s, 40s and 50s. It's like every time there's a scientific revolution or a scientific boom, there seems to be kind of like this need for human beings to create like social revolution, social, you know, uh there's got to be a social change. Why do you think that is? I, you know, I don't know, man. That's all. That's a, I, I, I think about that all the time because it's like, okay, here, you know, you got, you got uh, Rene Descartes and all these scientists covered it, Isaac Newton, blah, blah, blah. But then here comes Rousseau and, you know, all these writers who are trying to create social contracts and stuff. I, I think, I think it, m- You know, it, it could either have something to do with the fact that, for me, politicians take control of the scientific enterprise, you know, like you were saying, and they monopolize on it. And then here comes the social revolution, you know, right after, because they realize, OK, these politicians. Are, are you there. saying Rousseau was a politician or just a no, social theorist? I mean, I, th- I think Rousseau was a social theorist. You know, he he was known to be like a, you know, a pedagogist, like a, like a, you know, an educational philosopher or something like that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And he was, a, you know, a political philosopher. We could say that, you know, but um, I, I don't, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't a hard scientist. Right. And so some, I think some of these guys, they just grafted onto what was going on at the time as far as scientifically and, you know, engineering wise or what have you. And they're like, well, we need, we need to make something too. You know, there, there should be something, you know, that should trickle down into sociability, you know, social sciences or whatever that can change, you know, the way we do things. Cause I mean, you know, they had, there, there were wars and stuff like that in Europe for a long time. And then here came, you know, but I think it's because, you know, increased science technology creates, increased prosperity, increased uh, uh, differenti- differentiation between the rich and the poor, right? right. If right. there's a new technology that heals your disease and you get access to it first because you're in the elite circles, then that creates this burden on your heart that there's a differentiation that could lead to a kind of sacrificial oppression by which the poor are not having access to this new technology. So they're dying unjustly. So that's where those social questions come up right around those explosions in technological development, because there's this haunting that you have that feels like, wait a second, you know, if I have an unfair advantage, uh, how do I, how do I socially um, deal with this differentiation to make it less differentiated so that everybody has access to a hospital. Everybody has access to a cure Everybody has access to uh, a horse and buggy. Right. Uh, you know what I mean? If one's on a horse and buggy and one's walking, that feels unfair, especially if they're sick right. and they're poor, right? And if you're Christ haunted, technological explosions are going to come with questions about, well, how do we deal with social problems, right? Yeah. If you're not Christ haunted, then 
you're going to have more of the traditional bifurcation of society being a top rich elite and a very dirt poor. And there is no conversation because it's like, well, you're poor because the gods don't like you as much and they put you in your hierarchy position for a reason. Right. And you know, that's just the way it is. Right. So do you, but do you think that hierarchy is sort of embedded into human, human, like social, cultural, Yeah. you know, it's, it's almost like, we we can't avoid that, right? Yeah. Because how much, no matter how much we try to distribute the the you know, the the the, the science or whatever, how much we try to distribute medicine or whatever, there's still unequal outcomes. Yeah. Yeah, unequal outcomes. Somebody's so, going to be born the elephant man. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you can you can you can tinker with genetics all day long, but somebody's going to be born looking like elephant man. Right. You see what I mean? And, and so, but then how do you, how do you deal with that? Then, like, I mean, well, in the old days, they would stone someone that looked like the elephant <laughs> man, and now we don't. Now we put them into movies directed by David Lynch, and they get Academy Award nomination, right? Because we're Christian, <laughs> right? right? right. right. Amen, that's the- amen. That's yeah. what the resurrection that's- did. Elephant Man got an Academy Award nomination. In the old days, they would have killed him, right? Thanks be to Jesus Christ. That's why the resurrection happened, right? Right. And- not it's not funny but it's it's it, it's it's kind of it's kind of interesting how that works you know it's like we we show sympathy for people that you know who looks a little too different yeah who, who looks different yeah yeah and 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 but then at the same time i feel like that can also like turn into something where it just it just it's like out of control right, right. like what Every, like, so those who, you know, say wouldn't have had a chance to be on TV, you know, back in, say, the 1930s or whatever you want to say, right, on, on television, now have that chance to to be there, right? But then here comes everybody else. Like, here comes here comes all these other people who feel like, well, we should get sympathy, too, yeah. right? We, we should be on TV, too. We should be the one, you know, we should be making money, too. Why, why not us, right? And so there's kind of like this over you know, overindulgent, I, man, you know, I don't even want to say that because it's like, well, you can never have enough compassion. You can never have enough love, but I'm like, you know, isn't there a difference between love and compassion versus just kind of just letting everything be out there on the table? You know what I mean? I, I It's the I, question I, of what should be normative though. That's the yeah. question. That's yeah. the question we're talking about, right? Right. How yeah. things ought to be. So what the left does is they say, well, people like elephant man exist. Therefore the standard of beauty should look like elephant man. Right. You see that? You see the, see the trick they did. You see what I mean? Yeah. That's very important because in Christian society, we don't disrespect elephant man. We love him. We welcome him into church. He gets to have the Eucharist just like everybody else. He gets to be treated with dignity. The pagan society would have paraded him around as a god and then murdered him. Right. So what the left is, it's a fusion between paganism and Christianity in which they parade him around as a god and then say everybody else has to look like him. Mm-hmm. Or you you cannot distinguish between someone that looks like Elephant Man and someone that looks like not Elephant Man mm-hmm. in terms of saying, well, I would prefer to marry this woman, not the, gar- not the girl that looks like Elephant Man. Right. And then <laughs> you see what I mean? You see what I mean? You see what I mean? As soon as you yeah, and as soon as you do that, then you get you get scapegoated. Yeah. Why why don't you want to marry the woman that's yeah. like Elephant Man? Well, that's what the, the, the right makes the mistake because they're always reacting. Yeah. So the, all they do is react, and so the left's like, "Do not ever tell me the standard of beauty does not become <laughs> completely realized in the person of the Elephant Man," and the right says, "Oh, he's ugly." Right. Okay, sounds like a sounds like a toddler in the back seat. That's why you're not driving culture. <laughs> okay, sounds like a toddler. Welcome to Conservative Inc., bro. That's what I've been had to deal with for years. Okay, that's why I'm writing out here in the wilderness and doing podcasts in the wilderness here because these conservatives don't get it. Right, you know what I'm saying? Right. But it's so obvious when you look at a big picture what's going on. You know, and it's like so you have to go into that false dialectic and say, okay, no, we're not going to make mannequins. And you, when you walk by Victoria's Secret, they're not all going to look like man, elephant man type people. Right. Ooh, this is what beauty should look like. That's what the left does. Right. 
And the right looks at that and they say, oh, that's degenerate. They're trying to they're trying to destroy beauty. And it's like, well, it's more complicated than that. Right. But yeah. Retaliation. Yeah. yeah. Every time you say that they're ugly, you're making them destroy beauty even easier. You see, <laughs> you see? it's just this perfect, perfect paradoxical. Uh, they need each other. They need each other. You know, yeah. you need yeah. the person who says it's not fair that elephant man would get picked on and put in a circus in the past. Therefore, now everybody should say that there is no difference between elephant man. In fact, it's not just that there is no difference. That is the better standard. Right. You know, and, and, and ultimately that's where the right comes in and plays the reactionary card and says, no, back in the good old days, we didn't say that that was beautiful. Right. That's beautiful. And it's like, what well, would, well, you know, like you're not really adding to the conversation. You're actually enabling them to, to you're actually giving them fuel yeah. to destroy yeah. standards even further. Mm -hmm. And you're right. They never get rid of hierarchy. The left has a hatred for hierarchy, but they always go back to hierarchy. You know, they can't escape it. I mean, that's why that's why they privilege the pronouncements of the head of the uh, of the CDC more than they listen to the pronouncements of a person without power or influence. Why? Because there's hierarchy. Right. Why is that hierarchy sacred? Because they have the power. They have the might. They have the grandeur. They have the telephones. They, I mean, the, the television cameras. They have the makeup. Right. They have the credentials. They have the lab coat. It's all hierarchy. Right. Or, you know, why is it that Elon Musk is not allowed to buy Twitter, but uh, Jeff Bezos is allowed to own Amazon? Because it's hierarchy, right? Bezos is playing the game that's in powerful interest. He's, right. he's a team player. Elon Musk is a little bit more wild card. So therefore he does not have the same privilege in the leftist hierarchy to own a influential uh, platform of media like Twitter that Bezos gets to enjoy. You see, that's hierarchy. Yeah. yeah. So isn't that interesting? They tried every time they try to vanish and vanquish hierarchy, it pops up somewhere else. Right. 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 And, and, and in this case, it's more about, who has, you know, like you said, like the credentials or, the, you know, the money, right? But it's not just credentials. I mean, Elon Musk is a smarter man than Jeff Bezos in a lot of ways, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I would. I would. But the, I what's would. the difference is, is that Elon doesn't play as, I mean, he plays with the establishment, but he doesn't play as consistently for the establishment interests. Right. Right. You know what I mean? He kind of targets, he targets very various areas that he's interested in rather than just trying to, you know, take the whole you know the whole board or whatever yeah. you know like oh the, this this various thing you know twitter i'm interested in because i'm tired of you know the ability of not having free speech or people being able to say you know it was you know you've heard people say like it was supposed to act as a what the public square right and now it's not you know but warren buffett bill gates jeff bezos those are billionaires that are richer or poorer than Elon Musk. But what one thing they have in common is they're all okay with destroying free speech in this country and around the world. Yeah. And Elon Musk is not apparently as much. Yeah. He's got less appetite for going along with that. Right. And so because he wants to allow the common man to have an actual opportunity to speak, that's a, uh, that is an attack on the hierarchy. <laughs> you see what I mean? Right. So the left is now very conservative and reactionary. Which means that the that that's why the right is so use, useless in a lot of ways on some things is because they're just reacting to reactionaries. Right. right. <laughs> you know, they're not even offering a forward vision, but let alone they're still just reacting to people who are not even offering a forward vision either. <laughs> so. And is this what you, is this what is has, is this what you would describe as a as mimetic doubles now? The, the left and right. Yeah. Are we are we are we are we seeing sort of a mimetic doubling of of these two, you know, of these two groups. I'd say so. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, they, 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 you know, they're just sort of imitating each other now. You know what I mean? It's not even like a, yeah. And they're always trying to hide their sameness. Yeah. Like for example, just in the conservative world, uh, they used to say, you know, the neocons, the neocon Bush era conservatives used to say, uh, we're different from the left because we want to cut spending and cut entitlements and we're more pro-war. And then the new right that's come out is saying more like, well, we're not like those fake neocons. We're actually against the war yeah. uh, wars. Right. But then they say, but we need to be more like the left on economic. Well, you see how they're always slipping in their imitation 
It's like they stop imitating one piece, but they start imitating another thing. Right. And then they say, you know, and then you hear these little, little, literally these platforms, they say, we are going to cancel, cancel culture. That's literally mimetic undifferentiation <laughs> as a brand. They're literally just saying we are mimetic doubles. Welcome to the mimetic double team. All we got is doubling down on whatever the heck they're doing. You're right. Okay. You're right. No wonder you're irrelevant. You're right. The anti-social mm-hmm. social club. Yeah, mimetic doubling. Yeah. They say, we're going to cancel, cancel culture. Can you hear that? I mean, goodness gracious. <laughs> and, then you, and then you hear some of the other conservatives say, we got to be, and, and it's like, I agree with them. It's complicated. Like, there's the new right, younger people are saying, you know, we can't be like the old right. They stood by principles, and they were more above the fray, and they were, they're always getting dunked on by the left that was ruthless. And, you know, you know, you look at the Supreme Court vetting of, of the Brett Kavanaugh guy versus Kentanji uh, Jackson, right? And it's like it's totally, totally less vicious on a magnitude that uh, that's just hard to even compare, right? Um, and the and the right says, see, this is why you guys, lo- you know, this is why the old neocon conservatives lose, is because you guys are always playing really nice and decorous, and 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 we, you know, we need to take the gloves off and box and win and beat and get the power and all this stuff. That's not going to work, you know. It doesn't, but at the same time, I want to agree with them on something that, yes, there's a kind of fake decorum where, you know, you got people like Mitt Romney saying, oh, you know, we're, we're, we're above the fray. We're not going to stoop to the ugly level, but he sure will support, you know, uh, you know, saying, you know, basically Tulsi Gabbard is a traitor and needs to be arrested for criticizing foreign policy in Ukraine. That's pretty ugly. You know what I mean? So he didn't say dumb, dumb, like Trump said, but it's still pretty ugly. It's just clean rhetoric, ugly. You know what I mean? So they're always hiding their ugliness. The old right, the old establishment Republicans hide their ugliness with fancy decorous speech, you know, nice, clean rhetoric. Right. Whereas the new right is trying to say, well, let's just use the blunt language, call them dumb dumbs and idiots and, you know, goofers and goobers and right. woo woos yeah. and all that, you know, and that somehow makes us edgy. And I kind of understand on one level because the average person talks more like that. Yeah. Right. Than Mitt Romney. They talk more like Trump than a Mitt Romney. Yeah. So resonating yeah. with people where they're at is not a bad idea in, in abstract, right? Yeah. But then, and then, but, but then, then you get to go too far with that. You just become dumb. You know, yeah, well, I mean, it just like becomes extreme to the point to where even, even when you do that, like it's not even, you're not even paying attention to what they're saying anymore. It's just more like, then it becomes like a show. Yeah. Right? Like a show of who's going to be the, the top debater, who's going to be the one to stamp it, you know, stamp out the other person. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, what, you know, that, that how does that benefit anyone who might have conservative leanings, you know, as far as values and morals, right? If, if the thing we're supposed to do is be, you know, say, look, you know, I, I don't agree with your behavior. You know what I mean? I don't agree with this thing within the culture or whatever, whatever. You know, I think, you know, those things can be, I, I think that's the Christian way. Right. To approach these things in a way to where you rebuke the behavior, you know, but you don't you're not knocking the person. Right. You know, you're not saying this this individual is evil within their nature or 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 they're totally good within their nature. You know what I'm saying? You're just saying that, look, I don't I don't agree with this, man. I think that this is bad. I think this is this is going to sound wrong for our culture. And just think about the next generation. Right. Like, what are we doing to them? What are what kind of problems are we laying at their feet? Right. That's- yeah. And that's and that's why, you know, I've always said that thing about the the woman accused of adultery, that the right wants to stone the woman because she was accused of adultery. And the left wants to stone Jesus because he told the woman, go and sin no more. Right. So both of them want to murder somebody. Right. right? And the and the real Christian response is to step in there and agree with Jesus and say, no. We're not killing this woman and no, we're not killing Jesus because he said, don't do it. You know, and that's the balance that we're trying to take. Yeah. And that's what the left and the right don't understand. And that's why we've got to bring a new framework. That's going to shake things up because what we're offering is very attractive. Actually, you know, right. it really is. Everybody gets something out of it. Yes. I can go up and say, we're going to protect elephant man. We're not making fun of him. Mm-hmm. We're not making fun of him. But I can also say, hey, you know, I think it's going a little bit too far to say that a 
uh, you know, a, a, a defect that someone's born with has to be sacralized as the standard normative of how we should all strive to look. You right. see what I mean? That's an important balance. Right. Go and sin no more. And it's not a sin, but it's related to the question of go and sin no more because flaws and mistakes and deformities and being too short or too obese or too tall or too small or too whatever, those are an effect of the fall just like sin is. Exactly. Right? Yeah. That's exactly the way I see it. Yeah. So we're yeah. going into that and we're saying, look, there's sins and then there's there's fallen things that are not sins, but they're still things that we don't want to say should be the standard. Right. If you got a tumor out your neck, we don't want to laugh at you like previous past, but we also right. don't want to say, hey, let's make sure everybody gets tumors. That's what the left does. Right. This guy's got a tumor and he's sad. Let's make sure everybody gets a tumor now. It's like, no, stop. That's not going to work. Right. You know? Right. And the right, all they ever do is just say, hey, hey, don't make sense. He's ugly. He's got a tumor on his neck. It's like, no, bro, that's not the answer. Yeah. The answer is solve the damn cancer and respect people who got the tumor in the past, right? <laughs> that's what, I, that, that's the, that's the thing that I'd be saying. It's like, man, can't, just, you know, just like you were saying, like, why can't we encourage kids to get involved in science and tech and engineering? I just, I, I you know. I think that's the thing that frustrates me so much, you know, and I, and I think honestly, a lot of the, maybe part of the reason why maybe me and you may be so much more passionate about that, I think is because we came from, you know, the days when, you know, like in high school and stuff where, you know, <clears throat> science and math were important, right? Like tech, tech and stuff was important, but it wasn't really like a, like a, like a, exciting thing you know going up coming in high school and stuff like that you know what i mean and a lot of it was encouraging you to do like computer science and, and that kind of stuff right analytics but there wasn't anything as far as being out being outside doing hard sciences like actually building stuff right and that's the i think the for me that's kind of the thing that the, the nostalgia or the the longing for that like i wish that <clears throat> we had that when we were coming up because we could have pass them on to the next generation. Now everybody is just teaching, you know, they, they want their kids to learn how to code. You know, they want their, their, their kids to learn how to play video games mm -hmm. and all that stuff. And I'm like, I don't think that that's, I just don't think that that's um, healthy. You know, I don't think it's healthy. And I don't, I honestly don't think that's where the future lies. You know, I and you know, there's just so much of like being on the web and being online I think it takes you out of the real world. You can't actually, you don't know how to engage with people and stuff like that, you know? And, and I think that that it creates, it creates a lot of friction, you know, in the long run, right? Like boys and, become very isolated, you know? And a lot of that is because we have a disembodied Jesus. We have a disembodied Jesus that the church has, to, has been teaching on accident, a Gnostic Jesus right? About mental precepts that you need to assent to rather than the incarnational Jesus who resurrects in the physical body, right? And when you don't have that, uh, we, if you don't have an anthropological Jesus, if you have just a theological Jesus, then you don't have the full picture of Jesus. And then you don't have a story to pass on to people to get them excited. See, if people listen to our show, I know this sounds kind of uh, um, patting ourselves on the back, but if people hear, I, it's not if I hear what they say, yeah. they come up to me when I go to, sh to places where people listen to my show would hang out. Right. And they say, you inspired me and gave me a new take on understanding Jesus. I was an atheist before or I lapsed in my faith and now I'm excited. Now it's not me. It's because we're talking about the biblical faith. Right. We're actually talking about it. It's so rare to find people to talk about it in the public square that when you actually talk about it, it's a it's exhilarating for people. Yeah. Right. And so we're just passionate about it and it's infectious, but it's not our passion. It's the passion of Christ being properly understood as a real event that should get you off your seat and doing something because it actually happened. Right. And nobody wants to say that because they're afraid mimetically that they'll get looking like, you know, they're dumb or right. something. And, right. and there's a reason why they should feel that they're dumb, because when you've been taught a theological disembodied Christ, then it is kind of dumb to talk about resurrection. But once you understand the anthropological evidence for why the resurrection really happened, it liberates you to go kick some tail and have fun. 
because death has been defeated and we live in a culture of death that doesn't know that the resurrection happened. Even the Christians act like the resurrection didn't happen. They act like Einstein and, and, and quantum physics is the end of story about um, atoms. And I'm like, well, how do you know? That's not how a Christian would deal with it. The Christian doesn't say, okay, we've reached the end of history, the combustion engine and all the different derivations from that are the final answer on energy. No, the Christian would say, I don't agree. I don't want to keep looking to find the answer that actually helps the common person. Right. Right. But instead of looking for political prescriptions, someone comes up with a technological idea and you figure out how to scale it up so that everybody can enjoy it. Yes. Right. Yeah. The signs and wonders. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. Signs and wonders. And the greatest sign and wonder of Jesus was the resurrection. Mm -hmm. But nobody wants to talk about it because it's so weird that it's like aliens not allowed to talk about it. But guess what? We're going to talk about it. And guess what? Just like UFOs was not talked about in the public square, and now it is. Yeah. You just watch. Yeah. This is going to be talked about in the public square as something that people have to reckon with yeah. because it's true. Because once they understand, you know, that that all societies have the same pattern of a dying and rising God, but this is the one real event that happened because it created schism everywhere it went. That's when you know something exciting is afoot. That's why our society is schismed all the way through is because the power of the resurrection is continually upending our culture of death. Right. See, we were going to continue to have a culture of death until Christianity teaches the importance of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, that the body is important and you don't get to mangle your body just because you don't like the way it looks or the way you feel. Right. The body is a sacred temple. Right. You know what I mean? And the pagans always want to mangle and destroy the body with tattoos and doing all kinds of stuff to it. Yeah. But the Christians respect the body and we love our body because the body is part of the resurrection. Right. And when you have a bodily resurrection, that means there are certain rules about how you should treat somebody else's body. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and your own, you know, your own and somebody and, and others, right. Because it's, you, we're made in the image of God, right? And so are other people, right? To love God with all your, you know, all your heart and mind and soul, right? It's the same thing, right? To love your neighbor as yourself. It's, I think that's the same, you know, sort of sort of comparison, right? Yeah. That, you know, recognizing that <clears throat> God gave you this body, God, you know, created you and God created other people, you know, in his image. We have a, we have a, you know, and I don't want to say like it's we have a duty to love or something like that, you know, because that sounds too Kantian. But I would say, you know, we have we have a we have a duty to. To 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 study, I think, the Gospels in order to get us to a point to where, you know, we. We we feel sort of a, a conversion moment, you know, or something like that, you know what I mean? I mean, you can't force anybody to feel, you know, sympathy or whatever, but I just think that like, that's part of our culture. You know what I mean? Like you were saying, you know, to, to have that sympathy, to also have that understanding that other, other people are made in the image of God, just like us. Right? I mean, why is it that we have in ancient religions, uh, sacred priests and gods who were um, uh, hermaphroditic? Yeah. or androgynous. Yeah. Why? And why is it that a society that has been haunted the most content, the most continuously about the cross and the crucifixion and the resurrection, why is it that that's the society that instead of the androgynous or hermaphroditic person being a member of the priestly sacred realm, is now the standard normative of how things ought to be. It is an unleashing of the sacred. The sacred is like this substance and it was in a glass and it's been busted open. And now it's just pouring out all over the society. And it's only in the West. This is scientific evidence of the resurrection. It's like, it's so hard for people to grasp this shit, but it's yeah. true. Well, it, it was, it was, it was, <laughs> I mean, to be honest, to be honest, man, you know, despite like my, my leanings to, you know, reading Gerard and leanings toward anthropology, I never really thought about it some of these things in the way that you describe them. Right. And we've been talking, you know, knowing each other for a long, you know, quite a while now, but I, I never, I think I never, you know, like I was saying earlier, just, I never really thought about it in that way. Like how, 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 how the resurrection, you know, the dying and rising Christ basically 
open Pandora's box. You know, it's like good and bad. Yeah, good and bad. Because it's right? what we do with it. And we're yeah. not doing anything with it as much as we could because we're we're wasting our time with bad ideas yeah. about Jesus. Yeah. Because it's hard sad. to imitate Jesus, right? Yeah. 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 And if it's, we imitated Jesus, we'd be doing these paradoxes where we respect people who are fallen. Mm-hmm. And just like we all are, because we recognize that in their fallenness is a reflection of our own fallenness. Mm-hmm. But we also look for the good in them because that's a reflection of the image of God in us. Right. And that's the solidarity that we bring to the table. And the Christians should be leading the way. And we will lead the way yeah. because this thing is going to catch on. Yeah. I do believe it, man, because, you know, it's not like we're saying something that, I mean, it is very difficult to live out the faith of Christ. But to see the actual evidence of Christ is not that hard if you, if you, if, if you understand the anthropological dimension of what the Gospels are doing, right? Does that make sense? It's like once you see it, once you have the superior theory for how history goes and how history was and where it's heading, you are the ones with the energy in the room. Right. And that's where we need to be as Christians. Right. So that we can perform signs and wonders, because I guarantee you is if people understood what we're saying instead of this false dichotomy of judge the different person or worship them. That's what left and right Christianity does. We say, no, that's not the way of Jesus. Just follow Jesus and it will solve a lot of these tensions between communities. You can reconcile people who are interested in this tribe. Wokeism can be reconciled with deep Orthodox Christianity. You can. It's not reconciling in the sense of on the terms of wokeism, because that's not in control of history. Jesus is in control of history. So the reconciliation has to happen within Jesus's frame of dealing with these problems. But these problems can be sorted out, yeah. right? But we have to do signs and wonders, I believe, in order to, and also good movies and art, yeah. so that yeah. people are capped, their hearts are won over for the beauty of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And, um, and there needs to be films that portray What I'm saying is, which is we reject the violence, we reject the sacrifice and the exclusionary ugliness, but we also are going to point people towards beauty and goodness and truth and, 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 and good and good living. Right. Right. And that balance is what we don't have on offer. You know, we don't get that. Yeah. We should have hierarchy, but it should be natural. Right. Not forced by violence. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think we need to do, somebody needs to do another DreamWorks film like they did the Prince of Egypt, you know, they should make a one about a Christian story too, you know, mm-hmm. like that film to me was very, you know, I remember watching it when I was like in middle school, you know, but it was very impactful for me. You know what I mean? It really put like the prophets, you know, in an image to where like, mm-hmm. you know, even a kid would be interested in hearing about this. You know what I mean? Biblical stories, of course, are, are not always kid appropriate, but that, it it made it to where you know a child could be you know wrapped up in a in a biblical story yeah and i i feel like you know those days man like the late 90s and stuff were, were really like they had good films you know right. like animation you know yeah. and you know i feel like what well, that leads me i wanted to include this quote because you had asked me to reference it this is the evolution and conversion book that renee gerard did you wanted to know about the Pharaoh thing. And I found the quote for you for this episode. He, he's talking, he says, I remember an occasion when Michael Ceres came to me while he was writing his book statues. We were talking about funerary rituals, mummies, and the pyramids with the Pharaoh's dead body at ground level at the center of the building that in its shape is reminiscent of the collective stoning of the original lynching. One day Ceres said was very excited because he had found a text in which it was said that the people who did the technical work of mummification performed it with a particular ritual technique. At some crucial point of this ritual, they all fled as if they had committed a crime. So he says, when one is aware of the mimetic theory and finds examples such as this, one has a sense of recognition. Um, So the idea is, you know, just to kind of recap to where we started, because we're talking about resurrection on this day. Interesting. Joseph is in that Egyptian community. His story starts off. He's thrown in a cave to die. 
but he doesn't die in there. He, the camera goes down with him into that ditch or that well, mm-hmm. and it stays with his perspective. And he comes out of that cave. Yeah. Pharaoh stays in the, the, the pile of stones okay. and, yeah. and he stays in there because if you look at the ritual of them fleeing as if they've done something wrong because he was murdered and they don't right. want to, resu- yeah. they don't want to exhume the body right. and they don't want, they're ashamed of what they did. Right. 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 Is he, it, 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 with, with Jesus, you know, he doesn't leave you in that state of shame. Right. You know, you know, the people of uh, Joseph's brothers are ashamed of what they've done at the end of the story, but he reconciles with them. He gives them love and mercy and grace. Right. Uh, because Jesus, because God gave him grace and God gave him mercy through the, through the trials. He was right. thrown into a belly of, of, uh, of the earth, but he didn't stay there. The camera right. stayed with him and he doesn't get revenge. He gives forgiveness. Okay. okay. Right. And that's what we're celebrating on resurrection is this idea of, of, of when you talk about, Jesus saying, who's going to cast the first stone, right? That, that calls to mind the anthropological origins in which people in, you know, Neanderthal days were being stoned to death uh, because they were the alpha who had long stayed yeah. past their, their, their uh, place as the tribal leader, or they were looking like elephant man or whatever it was. They overstayed their welcome. That's yeah. Or they looked a different way or they were weaker or they were smaller or whatever. And they got lynched when people were stressed out. Right. And and so those stones, you throw in a bunch of rocks on a guy and he looks like a, it's a, there's a body under than those piles of rocks on the primitive archaic level eventually becomes codified into nice, pristine uh, pyramids that look really nice and shiny on the outside, but have dead bones in the, in the bottom of it. Exactly what Jesus describes as the Pharisees, right? And the Sadducees that you guys look like whitewashed tombs, but inside are dead bones, just like the Pharaoh temples. Right. And so the idea of the stone rolling away with resurrection is the end of the tomb culture, the, the culture of death. Okay. Now, <laughs> now that, now that makes sense. You said, said now that it makes sense. Cause I thought you were trying to, I thought you were relating it to sort of like, uh, you know, there's evidence in the tomb that, you know, like, like, like you, if you go around and you swipe something, you, you know, you get some debris or something, but I didn't, I didn't get, I didn't understand how you, you were, you know, it's almost kind of like a cultural ending. You know, it's like that that stamps out this 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 thing of scapegoating and, 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 you know, death. Right. And it's the same thing, like you were saying, with like the Egyptians. I never thought of it like that. Like they actually that's because they fled the tomb. But they, that was a they ritual. Mer- that, that was a, they were re- they were enacting a memory that they don't even know why they're enacting. You right. Know what I mean, but they, well, well, no, because a pharaoh could have died of natural causes and they still did the mummification and then they all ran. Right. Now, someone could try to make a. Well, they were just scared because they were in a scary room. <laughs> they wanted to get out for the ghost got them. I mean, but that yeah. that's kind of in keeping with the same mindset, just like just like Herod was terrified at the thought of of uh, of uh, John the Baptist coming back as a vengeful ghost. Right. Right. <laughs> you see what I mean? Because he, you see, what I mean? it's the same thing. Those 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 Egyptians were running because yeah. they're they're They feel as if they've murdered somebody. And there's also probably a worry about being cursed because you're in the presence of this of this vengeful spirit who could get in your way if you're in his, if his burial chamber. Right. Right. And so then it becomes just, sacralized, you know, it becomes sacralized right in, in sort of, you know, in the text or in, in the, the rituals. Yeah. So that's why the stone rolling away is so important as a motif in the gospels. Right. Because that that's the idea of who's going to cast the first stone versus the stone rolling away. You see the difference? The who's going to cast the first stone is who's going to initiate, who's going to take individual responsibility for their participation in the ugly collective violence that humans have been doing. And then the other question is, that's the that's that's where humanity was. And then Jesus concludes his mission in that period by saying the stone rolled away and here I am. So you can't you now you have to see what you were hiding. Now you have to see what you'd covered up. Now you can't run from your uh, little, your little lie that it's okay to murder somebody or exclude somebody for everybody else to feel better. I'm going to blow it all open. And now you have a choice to love your neighbor as yourself or to be destroyed as a species. Right. And that's where we're at. That's the apocalyptic moment we're at where we we're either going to sink or swim, yeah. you know? Well, thank you, brother. Thanks, I man. This is a good, a good uh, Easter, Easter talk, man. Yeah. I really enjoyed this. <laughs> And that's why Jesus said it is finished on the cross, which was 
that was the completion of our harmonization as a species. That's right. Amen. It started with the first stone and it ended with the final stone rolling away. And there's the resurrection. No more, no more hiding it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. All right, brother. All right. Take care. Do it again. All right.